Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And thank you for the folks who've been looking after me. It's been fantastic. First time in Turkey. I've been here two days. And I've been overwhelmed by the warmth and generosity and kindness. What an amazing country. Give yourself a round of applause for being great. I want to thank the guys at the top who've done a great job. They've been amazing, really supportive, because a lot of th these things happen because of people doing this stuff and the people at the back. So thank you for everybody who made this happen. Thank you to the speakers. Fantastic. The last guy talked about simplicity. I'm going to talk about the opposite. I'm going to talk about complexity. Why robots need to dream, okay? I work at a very, very large company called IBM. They've been inventing the future for years. They're amazing. It's a really interesting company to be in. Um, I come from a place called Manchester. You might have heard of it. Manchester is a, a town that at one point was the wealthiest city in the world about 100 years ago. It was the center of the Industrial Revolution 2. We're now into Industrial Revolution 4. The thing about Manchester, it made its money on cotton, and it rains a lot in Manchester, right? That's how many days we've had since it, 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 <laughs> it hasn't rained. It rains a lot. Because it rains a lot, you can process cotton, and you can... Um, build wealth. Uh, the reason, the re if it rains too much, you kind of stay inside, and you, you, you form a band. You dream of getting away from Manchester. It's a miserable gray place. And you, you, you either learn to play a guitar or you play um, football. And there's two teams in Manchester. One's red, one's blue. I support the red team, but don't, don't tell my uncle. He's a blue. Um, so I was a big football fan, and I got to a certain level as a school kid, and then I had a knee injury, and I couldn't play. And I could have maybe, maybe have gone a bit further, but hey, I could also draw. So um, as a dreamer, I thought I'd better do something where I can bring it all together. And I became a designer. And as a designer, I started it off in the analog world, and then I've had to reinvent myself consistently all the time to become a service designer. I design services, and I work with IBM to design the services of the future. And it's key that I dream. And, and, and one of the things I've done is I've traveled all around the world doing this. I've lived and worked in Hong Kong for, me, for, for many years. I uh, lived in America for, for a few years, the Middle East, Australia. And now I'm in Ireland, where it rains even more than Manchester. It's terrible. Um, I'm also a teacher. I've lectured extensively at Glasgow School of Art, which is an amazing place and places like uh, Central St. Martins, and Middlesex University, and SCAD. SCAD is in America, it's where I set up the first uh, degree, MFA, BFA in service design. Service design is still very new. Um, it's about complex systems. It's about how we bring all these different touch points in our lives together to make something different. Now, one of the things that interests me is business. So I also, I'm an angel, yeah? Um, my mother thought I was an angel, my friends think I'm a bit of a devil. Yeah? And as an angel, it's a great way to lose lots of money really fast, even better than a casino. Um, I've had some success and I've had some failure, and it's the failure that is the most valuable. You learn an awful lot. Um, what I do is, 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 as a designer, as a service designer and a UX designer, um, I, I talk to people a lot. And I talk to people and they tell me the stories. And these are pictures of people that I've taken. My hobby is photography, and I love taking pictures. And these guys, and these folks were kind enough to let me t take their picture, and they told me their story. They told me their story about their hopes, their dreams, and their fears. We live in a world of change, incredible change that's happening, phenomenal. We're seeing so many seismic shifts in the way technology, society, the way business, everything is changing. It's the most uh, change that we've ever seen in any one period. Huge economic disparity. Now, I want to get these facts right, okay? Here we go. 8% of the world's population controls 80% of the wealth. But it's just 1% that controls half of that wealth. And 90% of the world hold 80% of the debt. That's no accident. That's being constructed. Neoliberal economics. This world has created great wealth and, pl and plenty for a few, and there's a load of people who've been left behind, and that concerns me. It also concerns me that we have 
a planet that's dying. 100 species become extinct every day. I love that film at the beginning with, with a teaspoonful of, of, uh, of sea creatures. Amazing. We've got CO2 emissions that are at a level where it's changing the way the planet behaves. There are those who will deny it. 0.1% of people deny that there's anything going on. 99.9% .9 of the scientific community say there's a real issue. We also have digital disruption, and this comes and conflates in many ways. We've got everything from the digitization of the systems and services that we use to things like bio... Uh, technologies, um, to things like um, huge amounts of data and hugely connected networks. This is really complex stuff and it's disrupting. There's those who live in a technocracy where they have control and can move the, move the game on and there's those who are being left behind. We're promised this utopia. They sell it to us. Emancipation. You're going to be free. And this is a, a, a great picture from the 50s where, where robots were going to save us all from daily labor. The reality is a little bit different. This is a real robot, and it's owned by a company um, called Boston Dynamics, which is owned by Google. And this is the next generation of cyber warfare. It's, it's physical. This is an advanced robotic uh, machine that's able to do all the things that a soldier can do and more. The thing about it is that it's pow the, the, the limiting factor at the moment is power. It has to be tethered to generate the, the, the energy. But there's other robots they've built which do, 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 do some incredible things using uh, diesel and petrol engines. But it's the future of where warfare is going. So, so, so while we hear about the great things happening in robotics and, and automation, and things like the digital economy are changing our lives for a lot of good. There's also a more malevolent side to it. This is a picture of a robot's dream. Robots are now dreaming. What they did at Google is that these very clever neuro um, technologists got together and they, and they showed lots of images to uh, a, a computer. And they showed them everything from animals and sheep to things like architecture. And the computer's got an ability to recognize and begin to dream. It's forming a consciousness. This consciousness is also married with the fact that we have data everywhere. 600,000 swipes of Tinder every day. Like, like, like. No. Something like, I might get this number wrong, but something like 2.5 quintillion bits of data per day are generated. That's an enormous number with so many zeros, I can't even count them. It's everywhere. We're creating it in our watches, in our phones, all the time, continually feeding data, 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 data. So much data, so complex. We as humans cannot actually grasp the enormity of it, nor can we deal with all that data in a meaningful way. Data is the new oil. It's no good if it's left in a computer doing nothing. So what we do is we, we look at ways of how we can analyze this data. But you know, a human analyzing data takes a long time. So we develop these incredible programs which allow us to analyze this data really, really fast and form relationships between data where there is actual no connection, um, which is obvious. It's so complex. And we're able to do this with systems that now give us the power to take very unstructured, unrelated data and make sense of it very, very quickly in a way that we can't. So we're evolving now. Our brains are evolving now through these um, types of approaches. It's called cognitive computing. Shouldn't be confused with, 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 machine, uh, with machine learning. Slightly different. What co cognitive computing does is it allows us to... Or, the machine is able to understand and learn and interact with us. So you might have used a chatbot. A chatbot is a way of interacting with a cognitive system. I thought for, for a year I was talking to somebody when I was phoning up for help, and, and then they, they'd start interacting. I thought it was a person. Oh, thanks very much. It's great, fantastic. It's a chatbot. Don't know, they don't know me. They're just a machine, okay? The thing about this is it learns, and it learns really fast. These cognitive systems learn really fast, faster than we can. So increasingly, we have to deal with very complex problems consisting of very diverse services and products, and they're all entangled in these very complex ecosystems. 
And my job is to try and make sense of those for you, for people. So I've evolved an approach with, 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 the, with the colleagues that I work with called Design 4. And it's about ta tackling the big issues for uh, the cognitive age, for Industry 4 as it's referred to. You'll hear this phrase, Industry 4. It's the smart industry, it's the connected industry, it's the data industry. We're in the cognitive age. It's the age where machines are thinking, and they have a consciousness, and they can dream. It's an exciting time to be involved in working um, with these sorts of problems. The important thing is, is I try to deliver social equity, business equity, service equity, and experience equity. Because then it has value, value for you, value for the, for the people who run the services, and value for the businesses that create those services. So the way to see it, if you want to understand how it all maps together, is we've got all these different areas where we can innovate and change. We can dial things up and down. And we can use different types of technology like bio. We can use data and IT for technology and en energy. We've got business, we've got design, we've got behavior, and we've got culture. Business tends to be concerned with enterprise. IT about technology. User experience design is about behaviors and design strategy. Service design is much more encompassing, but design for is transformative because it deals with all the six domains. So design for has its roots in service design and experience design. And it has some common tenets around people, co-creation. It's about uh, being able to be agile, working in a sustainable way, and being connected. So these are the six tenets. People-centric means it's about being usable. Co-creative is about bringing different systems together, people to work together. Inclusive means about social inclusivity. Sustainable means that it's something that's going to be around tomorrow without damaging the planet and without damaging businesses and people. Agile is about working really fast. And then connected is about bringing it all together and sharing data in a smart way. So to do this, uh, we've constructed a series of playbooks. And there are all these are design activities which allow people from different backgrounds and different interests to come together and work together in a way that allows us to share information very quickly. But not only just information that we create through doing things like user research and talking to people like I used to do, but working with machines. And at the moment, we don't have a very good way of doing that. There's huge amounts of data that are coming through the system that work and happen so quickly that we're unable to actually engage with it. So we have to use this new approach of Design 4 to take this data in a way that we can use it and work with machines like they're people. And that's the only model that we have. Is, is, uh, we, look the, the, we look at how we work with people. We try and work with machines in a similar way. So we work together using these playbooks by combining approaches. And we, it allows us then to ask tough problems and solve tough problems. Okay? So how might we use advanced AI and cognitive systems to help people plan for the future? This is a project in Australia where I work with people to look at how they could use their money effectively that they'd saved in like a pension or they'd had in their house as a physical asset. And how could they actually use that money and as they began to move forward and, and, and go into a period of retirement, how they could have a separate, uh, a, a, a new type of life. Often people who retire have a third life. They, have a, they set up a company, they do charity work. So what we did is we looked at how we could use things like um, or, uh, uh, smart cognitive systems and what we call robo-advice to actually evolve a way of matching um, their, their desired outcomes with their intentions by using the, the, the assets that they had in a way that was based on what was happening in the world. We weren't able to do it. It's still too, it's still too complex to deal with, but we're working on it. How might we find new ways to co-create with machines? The big, it's, not, it's hard enough working with people. That's not so much of a problem. It's how do we deal with machines that are accelerating the way that they process and the way that they evolve? almost independently. We can't, for example, design chipsets anymore. They're so complex, they have to be done by machines. So how do we find ways to co-create with machines? This is a, a, a robot de developed by Germans. It's called RobDream. This robot 
copies and mimics what humans are doing, and then at night it sleeps, or when we sleep, it sleeps and dreams and processes this information that looks at different ways it can use this information. So this is a dreaming robot that is learning as it's dreaming. How might we deliver social and economic inclusion for people? It's a big world, there's a lot of people who have very little. So I developed a, a platform which it, it not only allows you to create a profile and, and a website and an e-commerce store all on your mobile phone, but the whole idea behind this was to then use an advanced um, search system and uh, cognitive system to then match you with people who were, were buying and selling things that you wanted. So you could set up a, some, a desired outcome and then it would go off and hunt for the best deal across a global network. And the whole idea of this was phase one, just to get people using it. Phase two would be to begin to add in additional features around things like social marketing. And then the third phase would be to bring in cognitive systems. How might we look at the impact we have on the planet and predict how our actions will, 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 will have, a, have, have an effect? So this was about a company which I invested in as an angel investor. And we started looking at this problem. And we, first of all, we needed to have devices, so we developed the light, plat, light pad, and we won demo, and we got financing. It's going to its second round now, seven million uh, second round funding. But we wanted to develop a system that you could uh, uh, attach any uh, product to it, an open API, it's called, to allow that data to be shared so we could analyze it, put the, put the information on the cloud, and then when you made a decision to turn on your AC, or to turn on a light, it would tell you the impact it would have on the environment. Or if you wanted to set a target to reduce your CO2, you could put that in and say, verbally, reduce CO2 by 10%, and it would do it all for you using the cloud. And your lights would adjust automatically. It would all be done from an app. How might we develop new skills for a more agile way of working, particularly given the fact that machines work faster than us? So we need to build new skills. So when I talk to new designers, I'm looking for designers who are able to do things like sense making, deal with a lot of complexity, that's cognitive load. I want them to be novel and adaptive thinkers. I need them to be computational thinkers. I need them to be design strategists. I need them to be able to work in virtual environments because a lot of what we do is across the world. I work with people all over the world. We, we meet on Zoom and things like that. But we need to be able to work in a virtual environment increasingly, dealing with a lot of complexity. And then how can we work transdisciplinary in a transdisciplinary way? Now, I started off as an analog product designer, and now I'm designing services, yeah? I also code, but I'm not a coder, yeah? I need to be able to think and work with other people in different ways. And then how might we connect with our wet biological systems with machine systems? So the real future is, how do we actually connect using things like new sensors. So this is Neil Harbison. He's an artist. He was born with color blindness. He senses color through vibration and sound. This antennae is hardwired into his brain, and he's able to sense and feel. This is the future of where we're evolving, and I, as a designer, am excited by it. So I ask you today, dare to dream. Thank you.